The purpose of this lesson is to learn how to locate database files, the difference between a full and incremental backup, different backup and restore strategies, how to dump database tables, how to load database tables, how to use MySQL hot copy, journaling, the binary log, and how to repair corrupted tables. The first part to being able to do backups is to know where your files are located. So to find the files, you can simply issue a command. And what happens is when you first launch MySQL, it reads in the contents of a configuration file. And that configuration file has the settings for where things are located, what options are turned on, and things of that nature. And what it will do is it will take all of the entries that are in that configuration file and loads them in as variables for the system. So if I want to know where they're located, I can issue show variables where, and then this is important, you got to have the casing correct, variable underscore name. And there's a command called like, and what like does is allows us to search for things that are similar. And one of the variables, is, I'm sorry, all of the variables for the directories end in the letters DIR. So they have beginning characters that may be different but the last three characters are always DIR. So what I can do is I can tell the system to look for um, anything that starts with anything but ends with DIR and then do this. So what that's going to do is it's going to look for the variable names and it will show us all of the ones that are like DIR. So they begin with anything. They can have anything at the beginning but they have to end with DIR. When I issue the command it will show to us all of the folders where all of our different databases uh, files are located. So if you notice, these all end in DIR. So what it's doing is it doesn't matter what it begins with as long as it ends with DIR. The one in particular that we're looking for is this one right here that says da uh, data dir. And notice it's under C colon backslash program data backslash MySQL MySQL server 5.6 data. That's where our actual files, files are located. So to locate the files, I'm going to open up File Explorer. I want to browse to the C drive. And you'll notice that program data is not showing in my list. It is a hidden folder, so we actually have to type that in, unless you have hidden files enabled. And so if I scroll down, I will see MySQL, MySQL Server 5.6, and then data. And so this is where our actual database uh, files are stored. And you'll notice each one gets its own folder. So for example, classic models we've been using, all of the tables, all the forms, they're all located right here in this one folder. Once we know where the database files are located, then we can back them up. The problem is, as I stated in a previous lesson, the DBMS has all of these files locked, and we actually cannot back them up while MySQL is running. So the question is, how am I going to back them up? All right, so one of the options is to stop the MySQL services, and when I stop those services, then it will allow me to do a backup of those files. Um, the other option is to use some utilities that are built in. Uh, we actually have the ability to, to do a backup directly in MySQL. It can export all the data. Or the third option is to simply do exports of data. So we have different ways to, to do backups. Our first way is to do what's called a full backup. Now our full backup includes the entire database structure, all the data, all of the tables, all of the roles, everything gets backed up. This takes a considerable amount of time and the problem is is that the database cannot be accessed during the time when it's actually doing the backup because the services actually have to be taken offline. Even if I use the built-in backup mechanism, it'll still make the database unavailable to all the users. The other type of backup is called an incremental backup, and what an incremental backup is is that it will only back up the changes that have made, been made since the last full backup. It takes considerably less time to perform these backups, and the system can be used while it's doing this type of backup. However, the problem is, is when I do a restore of the data, it's actually more difficult to restore it. So the benefit here is that I can do a full backup, have the entire database backed up and then at regular intervals I can do incremental backups without actually kicking all the users out of the system.
So it's very important to have a backup strategy. The most common strategy is to use that full daily backup. So typically what you'll see is that a company will do a full backup once a day, and then they'll do hourly or even more frequent incremental backups. There are other ways we can do backups. I'll talk to, those, or I'll talk to you about those later in this lesson. But the, the reason for doing this is that if I have the full backup from last night and I have hourly backups and something happens to the server, I'm never more than an hour out of backup. So if the last backup was 30 minutes ago, I only lose 30 minutes worth of data. Now there's, there's a way to prevent that from happening, which is there's a thing called the binary log. And the binary log is simply a log that keeps track of all of the changes that have been made to the system. It keeps track of all of the statements, all of the commands, everything that comes through the system, it gets, that gets stored. And what we can do is we can do continuous backups of the logs. So what that allows me to do is I do a full backup, say at midnight, I do hourly backups, and in between the hourly backups, I back up the log. Well, what that means is that I can restore my full backup, restore all the incremental backups, restore the log, and I'm back up and running. There are also these things called the journal files, and we'll explain what those are. One thing you need to know, it is not advisable to store the backup on the same physical server or the same drive as the, as the actual production server. It's also not advisable to save it in the same location. If you store it on the same server and that server gets fried, it doesn't matter if it had 10 different hard drives in it. Chances are those hard drives are all going to be bad if, if it takes a big enough power surge. Um, if you save it on the same drive and that drive fails, then the backups are gone. If you save it in the same location and the location catches on fire, gets hit for, by a tornado, it's all gone. So we want to make sure that the data is backed up to some sort of external media and is stored off-site. All right, so I back up my data. I do a full backup at midnight. I do incremental backups every hour, and I also back up the log. All right, so what I'm doing is I'm, I'm keeping all of the data that is in the system, but I'm making it where I'm only doing hourly backups. I only have to do a little bit of, of backup. I only have to kick the users off at midnight to do that full backup and then throughout the day they don't know that we're doing backups. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to restore the backup for midnight. Then I will restore each of the hourly incremental backups in order. So I have to do 1 o'clock, then 2 o'clock, then 3 o'clock and so forth. We are going to restore the binary log, which that's the log that keeps all of the statements that have been issued. And then also this thing called the journal files. Now what happens is um, MySQL is called a, a two-stage commit which means that when I actually write a, an entry to the database, so let's say I want to write a new record, or I want to update a record that's already there, then what happens is it gets stored in what's called a journal file, and then it also gets stored in the database. Now, it actually is stored in two locations until it has a full commit, and that full commit actually happens during the backup process. So we want to make sure we back up those journal files also. All right, so I'm going to perform some queries from a command line that will allow me to do things like selecting data from a database table. And by doing that, we can actually pipe this stuff out to external files. All right, so I open up a command prompt. And on Windows, I'm going to do it from the command prompt. On the Mac and in Linux, I'm going to do this from a terminal window. The only difference is going to be how you access the executables. Once you locate the executable, it will be the same the same commands to actually export the data. So one of the things you need to be aware of is if you have Linux or Mac, you have to locate where the data files are. I did show you in a previous video how to find those. So on Windows, it's located under Program Files, under a folder called MySQL, in another folder called MySQL Server 5.6, because that's the version that I have installed, and then in a folder called uh, bin. And bin is all of our binary files. So if I look at this, I can see these are all the binary files that we have. And the one that we want to use is the, the one that just simply says mysql.exe. This is our actual um, command line processor for all of the statements that we can issue to the system. Okay, so what I want to do is I want to issue a command to the database as if I were sitting in the 
uh, in the actual workbench performing a query. The problem is, is that I have to authenticate to the system. So when I open up Workbench, Workbench will ask me for the username and password. All right, so to do this, I'm going to issue a command stating MySQL, because that's the actual executable that I want to use. And it's actually MySQL.exe. You don't have to type the .exe. It will automatically assume that it's an executable. And I want to execute something. So I'm going to do minus E for execute. What am I executing? I am executing a select statement. I want to select everything from sorry, everything from a particular table. Now I haven't told it which database to use, so I'm going to have to do this in the database.table format. I want to get everything out of the classic models.customers table. So I'm going to say classic models.customers, and that's what I actually want to perform as my query. So I'm going to select everything from the database called classic models dot the table called customers. Now I have to authenticate to the system, so I'm going to type minus U, and then I type in my username. Now because this is just for a learning purpose, I am actually using the root account. I hope that in a production environment you don't use root. You should be using some separate user account. So I'm going to log in as root, and I want to type in my password, but I don't necessarily want it to show my password. So I could type in my password right here, and if I type my password, then it will automatically let me in. But if somebody else is standing around while I type my password in, they'll be able to see it because it's written here in clear text. So if I just push enter now, it will prompt me for my password. Type in my password, and it executes that query. And it actually gives this back to me in the form of a table. So it's a table at the command line. But one of the nice things with the command line is that I can take anything that we have um, that should be output to the screen and instead I could pipe that to a file. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to issue the exact same command, so I just push the up arrow key, and I want to pipe it to a file. So I'm going to output it using the greater than sign to some sort of file. Alright, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to output it to a folder called c colon backslash backups, and I'm going to give it a name. So I'm going to call it uh, customers.txt. And so now what this is going to do is it can export all of the stuff that's in this table and actually put it inside of that text document for me. Now when I press enter I won't actually see it do anything but behind the scenes what it actually just did is it output all of that stuff to that, fo to that folder. Alright so I'm going to go back to the root folder so cd backslash and I want to go to that backups folder. And if I do a directory, I will see that I now have a file called customers.txt. Now if I open this up in Notepad or some other program, I can actually access this. So let's do that. Let's look at a Notepad. There's our file. Now this is actually um, going to be tab delimited. Notice it's a tab. Which means that I can take this file and I can open it up in Excel instead. So I'm going to go ahead and open up Excel, and inside of Excel I'm browsing to the backups folder. Now by default I won't see anything here, but if I change this down here where it says all Excel files, I'm going to change this to all files, and now I can see my text document is there. And if I open this file, it's going to ask me how to import it, I'm just going to go ahead and finish, and you will see that you actually do have a table that is accessible. It's just a tab delimited table. So I now have something that is exported out into a tab delimited file that I can use as a backup of that table and I can also use that to get it into another system. My other option is to do what's called a dump and I'm going to do a dump from the workbench and the way that you do it is I'm logged in and on the left side here you'll see management. And when you go into management, what I can do is I can um, I can simply go to data export over here. And when I export the data, I have my database, my databases or my schemas listed here. And I want to export everything that's in classic models. Now if I click on it, I could export just individual tables, but I want to do the whole thing. Alright, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to do what's called a dump. And what a dump will do is just take everything that we currently have and it will output it all to the hard drive as files. So instead of having this in my 
users folder. I'm going to put this in backups. And I'm going to leave it as this dump. But if you notice by default, it'll be the year, month, and date. So that way you can identify when the dump was created. Um, if you're going to do more than one dump a day, you want to change this to something else. Okay, so here are the things that we have selected. We have the schema selected. We have all of the tables selected. I'm going to dump stored procedures and functions. We're going to dump events, dump triggers. So essentially we want to dump everything. We want to make it where I can export everything from the system so that way I can recreate this on any other system or even back on this one if something happens to it. So I also want to include this one that says include create schema. And what this will do is it will actually put the command into the exported files that it will automatically rebuild the database and rebuild all of the tables. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and start the export. It ran and it is completed. All right, so what I want to do is I want to go back to the C drive to our backups folder and I now have a dump folder. And inside of our dump folder are SQL files for each of the tables that are there. So if I look at this customer's table, I'm going to open it with Notepad++. And what it actually does is it creates all of the statements that are required to recreate it. So create the, the database if it doesn't exist. Then also drop all of the tables. So that way if we have a database table that gets corrupted, it will dump the entire table and it will rebuild it from this last set. So this is a, an actual full backup of that data, database. The only problem is, is while this is running, none of the users could be in. So just keep that in mind. When we do a full backup like this, the entire system, no users can be in it. We would have gotten an error if, they were, if there were people in it. I do also have another option for doing backups. Instead of backing up as individual files within a folder, I could back this whole thing up as one self-contained file. And so what I'm going to do is, once again, I'm going to change the location to our backups folder. And the options here are going to be the same. So we're going to include the schema. We want to dump everything. But I'm also going to create the dump in a single transaction. This will make it all one self-contained file to rebuild the entire database. The negative to doing this is going to be that if I want to restore just one database table, I can't do it. I have to restore the whole thing. So I'm going to start this. We'll let it run. It says it finished. So if I go look at my, uh, my backups folder, I now have a file here. It's a .sql. If I open it with Notepad++, same thing, where we have the full structure of the database. And what it's actually done is given all of the statements required to rebuild all of the stuff that is in the different tables. Now, if you're on a Linux machine or Unix or a Mac or something like that, you don't have the workbench installed, you can do this from a command line. There's a utility called MySQL Dump. And what it will do is it will create the same dump files just from the command line. Uh, the problem is it does a full system backup and it locks all of the tables, which means nobody can make any changes while it's being performed. Now, the database that I'm using is rather small and it did the backup fairly quickly. If you have a very large database table or a large amount of database tables, it will take considerably longer to do the backup. There's also a program called MySQL Hot Copy. Now this is going to be a Perl script that makes a database backup and you can only use this with the My, uh, My ISAM or Archive database tables and it only works on either Unix or Netware. But if you're using one of the older database formats and you're using uh, Unix or Netware, then you can actually use this utility. It is extremely fast at, at actually making a backup of the whole database. It has to be run directly on the machine. But the benefit of this program is that it actually will allow you to copy the entire database from one system to another fairly quickly. All right, so something that you need to understand is this process called journaling. What happens is when you actually perform a query, and you update or insert information into a database table it actually does not become part of the database itself. It becomes part of what's called a journal file or a log file. And in Windows, they are located at the C program data, MySQL, MySQL Server 5.6 data, and then it's called IB log file 0 and log file 1. Those are the two files that are typically used. If you have a large environment, you can expand those but this is the typical version. So what happens is I want to update something in the database. 
I want to change somebody's telephone number or their balance or something like that. I can't directly edit it in the database and that's there as a protection. Because if I were to update something into the database itself and something happens to the database before the next incremental backup occurs, my transaction gets lost. So the way the system works is it will write my query to the log file and then it will also write it to the database table after it's successfully written to the log. All right, but what happens is it doesn't fully commit the data until we run a backup. And so what will happen is these log files will continue to grow and grow and grow in size until the, um, until the backup occurs. All right, so what happens is I write my update to the log. It, get, it got written to the log. Now it writes it to the database. And the log file just keeps growing. So what happens is you'll have users that start complaining that the system is running slow, especially if you don't do regular backups, because the log file runs, I'm sorry, the log file will grow in size until the database actually gets backed up. All right, so what happens is during the backup, there's this process called truncation. What truncation will do is it'll take all the stuff that's in the log, and it will ensure that it's committed to the database, and then it, and then it actually will delete the data from the log. <coughs> All right, so an appropriate analogy for this would be like a secretary that has an inbox in his or her desk and also has a filing cabinet. Now, the secretary, um, anytime anybody wants to provide updates to whatever's in the filing cabinet, the secretary will not open the filing cabinet. What the secretary will do is the secretary will hand a piece of paper to the person asking them to write the updated information on the piece of paper. Then what will happen is the piece of paper gets put on the top of the stack that's in the inbox. All right, so what happens is, let's say I have, uh, I have a customer that has a, a balance right now of $100. And then what will happen is if the customer comes in and wants to, um, wants to deposit $200 in the account. So they start with $100, they add $200, they should have $300 in their account. But what actually happens is the $100 stays in the filing cabinet. There's a piece of paper in there with the customer's balance, and that stays in the filing cabinet. And then on the piece of paper that the person writes down and sticks in the inbox, that one says to add $200 to it. The customer comes back later in the same day, withdraws $50, so another piece of paper gets written that says subtract $50 from it. So what will happen is it's, it's actually keeping track of what the balance was at the time that that piece of paper was put into the system. So if I want to know what the current balance is for that person. Then what I have to do is I have to go check the filing cabinet to see if they have a, a record in there. So I look at the filing cabinet. The filing cabinet still says they have $100. Then I start in the stack of papers at the bottom and go through one piece of paper at a time until I find a piece of paper that has something to do with that customer. And then I can look at their balance on that one. Oh, okay, it's not $100, it's $300. Then I have to keep going through the stack until I find the next piece of paper that says, oh, no, it's not $300, it's $250. Then I have to keep going all the way to the end of the stack until I run out of pieces of paper to realize that I don't have any more transactions for that person. So what happens is the secretary is not going to commit the stuff to the filing cabinet until the end of the day. That's our backup process. So when we do a backup, we take all of the pieces of paper out of the filing cabinet, we, I'm sorry, out of the inbox, and stick them into the filing cabinet, and now they're committed, and now the inbox is empty. So the inbox is like our log file. The filing cabinet is like our actual data, database tables. So if I want to update something, I have to put it in the inbox first. Then it can be put into the actual database. But the problem is, is the size of the inbox is going to keep growing until it all gets committed to the filing cabinet, and that occurs during the backup process. There is another important file that we need to keep track of, which is called the binary log. Now, by default, this is not turned on. We'll actually have to turn it on for some of the, the capabilities that we want to add later in this lesson. But the binary log is responsible for keeping track of all of the updates, all of the replication, data recovery, backups, restores, everything. So everything that happens to the system gets written to the binary log. All right, so what happens is if everything that I'm doing gets written to the binary log, we end up with a slight performance decrease. However, the added benefit of this log significantly outweighs the, the negatives for writing the stuff to it. 
So what I'm going to do with this log is that I have the ability to completely reproduce our entire database. So what, I, what I'm doing is I'm looking at the binary log, and since whenever our last backup occurred, all the stuff that's in there is all of the statements that have actually been issued. So what I can do is I can take that log, put it on another computer, and then that log would actually replicate all of the stuff that occurred on the one computer on the second one. Now, one thing you need to be aware of is that the binary log is going to contain sensitive information. It will have things like usernames and passwords in it. It'll have all that kind of information in a log that anybody can get a hold of. So you need to make sure that you protect this file. Make sure it only has permissions for the people that actually need to be able to read the contents of it. You're going to set file permissions on it. So to start the log, what you're going to do on a, on a Linux machine or a Mac is to uh, simply start the MySQL process with the minus minus log dash bin and then give it some sort of name. And we call this name a base name. And essentially what the base name is, is going to be the name of the computer. That way what we do is when we replicate the data out, we know that this particular log file came from this particular computer. And then what the system will do is it will add either a sequence number or a date timestamp, depending on which version you're using. All right, so to enable the log in Windows, we actually have to modify a, um, a configuration file for MySQL. And the configuration file is located under Program Data, MySQL, MySQL Server 5.6. And what we're looking for is in the configuration file, we need to simply enable the log. So what I'm looking for is a section that looks like this. It says binary logging, and by default, if you notice, there's this little pound sign here. The pound sign means that this is a comment, which means it's not enabled right now. So if I want to enable it, then what I have to do is to remove the pound sign, and then we're going to say equals, and then whatever we want our base to be, so that way we're putting the name of our computer here. All right, so I'm at the command prompt, and I am in the program data MySQL, MySQL Server 5.6 folder, and if I do a directory, I will see that I have a file called my.ini. So what I want to do is I want to use notepad to open my.ini. And this is what that file looks like. Now, it is a configuration file. The pound signs over here, they mean that this is a comment, which means that this actually will not show, I'm sorry, will not be effective. The system will flat out ignore those. So what I'm looking for is a section that says binary logging. So the easiest way to do that is to find it. So I'm going to do control F to find binary logging. And here's the section that I'm looking for. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to uncomment this by simply deleting the pound sign. And then I'm going to put an equal sign at the end. Now, if I don't put the equal sign, it will it'll still create the log file. It just will automatically give it a name that may not necessarily make sense to me. So what I need to do is I need to give it some sort of name. So I'm going to call it something like computer name, which in, re in reality, you would actually put the real computer name here. So what happens is when I enable the logging, the files will get created and they will all start with computer name and then dot 0000001. The next one will be computer name dot 0000002 and so forth. So it makes it real easy to try to figure out which log file came from which computer. Once I have set the computer name in here and enabled log, uh, the binary log, then I want to make sure they save it. And then the next thing that I need to do is I need to stop and restart the MySQL uh, services. And so I can do that one of two ways. I can go to the services control panel. And I can scroll down to MySQL. So here's my workbench. And I can restart it. All right, the other option is to go through the workbench itself of these messages and I can actually come in here to management to start up shutdown and I can stop and restart it right here so I don't necessarily have to have um, the ability to get to services as long as I can get into um, into the management console I'm sorry the uh, workbench now the problem is 
I have to have administrative rights of the machine. If I click it here, it will prompt me for the UAC to make sure that I have administrative rights. Once the service is restarted, it will create under the program data MySQL, MySQL Server 5.6 data folder, it will create our computer name dot 0001. And what this is is the actual log, and you'll see more of these start showing up the more transactions occur in the system. So I'm going to go ahead and go back to the database, and we'll just issue some queries real quick just to get some information in the log. And I want to see what all stuff will actually show up in the log once I issue the commands here. Alright, so I'm just simply going to uh, do something like select everything from custom, I'm sorry, classic models.customers and we'll run this. So we get everybody and I want to update uh, the customer last name for customer number 112. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to issue a query that will allow me to update their last name for that particular customer number. So I'm going to do an update and I'm updating classic models dot customers. We are going to set the, I think it's the last name, let's see, customer last name. And we'll set that equal to um, Smith. And then where the customer ID, customer number is equal to 112. Perform that update statement. So now if I come over here and refresh, he's now Smith. And so now the intention is to see all of these transactions in the log file itself. So to be able to see the contents of that log file, I need to be in the uh, binaries folder. So it's program files, MySQL, MySQL Server 5.6 bin. And the program that I want to use is MySQL bin log. And what this program will do is it allow me to look at the contents of that log file. Now by default it's stored as a binary file which means I can't just look at it in a text editor. I have to have this program to look at. Um, so what I have to do is tell it the entire path to get to where the file is located. So that file was located at program data. And there is a space in this, so it has to be inside of quotes. So MySQL, MySQL server 5.6. And then it's under data. And it was called uh, computer name dot one, two, three, four, five, zeros, one. And now what this will do is it'll show to me the, um, the contents of that file. So what I can see is I can see all of the stuff that has occurred in that log file. So it set a session number for me. Uh, it's logging other information. It actually created the log file. And if I come down through the list here, I can see where I actually issued the command to update that particular customer number. So you want to be real careful because this information is not necessarily plain text, but anybody that has this program can open up this file. So now one of the things you'll notice though is there's also something here that says server ID, and we'll use this in a later rep, uh, lesson for replication because each server will get its own ID number, and it will allow us to be able to get information from, from one server to another and be able to replicate information. In a prior lesson, I told you that you cannot use the repair command for NODB tables. The repair command only works for my ISAM. It does not work for NODB. So what we have to do to do a repair of a table is we have to make an exact copy of the table, copy all the data from the table to the new table, delete all the contents of the original corrupted table, and then try to insert the information from the repair table back into the original table. All right, it seems kind of convoluted, but it works, um, except for what happens is if we have a record that's actually corrupted, then we'll have to insert so many records at a time until we can find the corrupted record and just simply not insert that one. So if this works, great. If it doesn't work, you're gonna have to do this maybe 100 records at a time, 10 records at a time, five records at a time, and so forth, until you can narrow it down to the one that's actually corrupted. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to pretend that my customer's table became corrupted and that I need to repair it. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to issue four commands. I could do these all at one time if I wanted to, 
but I'm going to do them uh, one at a time so you can see what they're like. I'm going to create table, and what I'm going to do is just simply make a table where it's the name of the original one and then put an underscore repair or something afterwards so that I know it's a repair table. So I'm going to say customers underscore repair, and I'm going to copy it from the customers table. So it's going to be like customers. And so what this will do is it will actually create another table over here called customers repair. And the intention here is, is that I can take all the stuff that's in customers and put it into customers repair. So if I were to, um, if I were to look at the table for the customers repair, the table structure is there, but there's no data in it because all I did was by using the like command, I just simply took the structure of the table and constructed another table with that same structure. All right, so the next thing that I want to do, I've already created it. I modeled it after the original one. Now I want to take all the information that's currently in the customer's table and stick it into this repair table. So I'm going to insert things into customers underscore repair from a select statement. So I'm going to select everything from customers. And so now what this is going to do is it's going to take uh, the select statement, select everything from customers, it'll load it in a table in memory, and then it will insert all of that stuff into the customer's repair table. So run that. Now if I select everything from customers underscore repair, now we have data in here. And the data here should match the data that's in the other table. Now what you may encounter is that you got errors. And if you get an error, and it says that there was an error at record such and such, then what you would have to do is limit the number of records. So maybe you only do 100 at a time. And so what this is going to do is it will copy the top 100. Now what would happen is if this is successful, then you copy the top 100, then you delete the top 100. Then you copy the new, the new top 100 and delete the top 100, and you have to keep doing this. So it may take a little while if one of the records is corrupted, you would have to actually limit it to this amount of tape of information. Okay, so I want to get rid of the data that's in the customer's table. Right now we have all the data still in the customer's table. So what I want to do is I want to do what's called a truncation. I want to truncate the table called customers. And what this will do is it'll take all the information that's in the table and delete it. Okay, so now if I go and do a select everything from customers, there's nothing in the customers table. So now I just do the reverse of what I did before, and now I'm going to copy all the stuff back from the repair table back to the actual production table. So I'm going to insert into the customers table the stuff from a select statement from customers underscore repair. So we're going to simply take the stuff back from this customer's repair, stick it back into customers. And so now if I select everything from customers, I should have my data back. And I do. So the last thing that I want to do now is I want to drop the data that's in, I'm sorry, I actually want to drop the entire table called customers repair. So I'm going to drop the table called customers repair and now it's gone. So what would happen is if I have a table that's corrupted I have to copy all the data from the corrupted table that I can get out to another table, remove the records that are corrupted, copy all the stuff back from the repair table, and then delete the repair table. It is more tedious but this is the way that you have to do it with an NODB table. In this lesson, you learned how to locate database files. You learned the difference between a full and incremental backup. You learned different backup and restore strategies, how to dump database tables, and how to load database tables. You learned about MySQL hot copy. You learned about journaling and its importance in our backup procedures. You learned about the binary log and also how to repair corrupted tables. Thank you.